So good morning, everybody. Welcome and thank you um, for joining us today. My name is Byla Lindner, and I'm joined by my colleague, Nicole Thomas, um, who is providing tech support today. Uh, we work for Homebase. In case you're not familiar with Homebase, we are a nonprofit organization that provides technical assistance and training to housing and homeless services providers in Santa Clara County. Um, today's training is ensuring that COC funded housing in Santa Clara County meets federal standards. And our main objective for today is to learn basic information that will allow you to conduct thorough HQS inspections. Uh, now we're going to go into some Zoom tips and information for you. Um, closed captioning is available. Um, you should be able to see a button at the bottom of your screen um, that says live transcript. Let us know if you're unable to find that. We can help you. Um, also, you all were muted upon entering the room, so to speak, and we ask that you remain on mute um, to avoid extra background noise. And lastly, um, we hope that you will really participate in this training. Um, we've got a couple of different interactive moments, activities, questions. Um, we also hope that you will ask questions throughout and share your own experiences if you've um, done these inspections before and share your knowledge with each other. Um, so we invite you to write in the chat um, or you can raise your hand and we will unmute you. Um, or if it seems like it's the right moment, you're also welcome to come off uh, mute as well to ask questions and make comments, et cetera. So we're hoping to make this sort of as interactive as possible because um, it's a bit of a dense training, not gonna lie about that. <laughs> um, okay, so let's practice using the chat function right now. Um, if you could all just please put in the chat your name, the organization you work for, and answer the question, if you had to teach a class on one thing, what would it be? So it looks like we got a couple people answering pool, ethnic studies, mental health systems. I hear. Um, um, Looks like voluntary service, We're getting some interesting, um, got some housing specialists here, lots of housing specialists. Good, great. Um, yeah, so just feel free to introduce yourselves and answer that question if you if you'd like to do so. Um, I one of the things that I think I would really like to teach a class on is reading books to children, because um, it's one of my favorite things to do. And I think there's like a right way to do well there's no wrong way to read books to children but i think it can be more fun in certain ways if you do certain things anyway i'm not going to get into it because that's not what you came here for today but um that's that's just what i would teach okay so the next slide is our agenda um so today um we are going oh i think we might have might have missed a slide, um, but our agenda for today is um, basically we're going to start with background on HQS inspections. Um, why are they important? What are the regulations that govern them? Um, going to provide some inspection basics. Um, so definitions, uh, what is the role of the inspector and in their discretion and tenant preference, some general unit requirements, specifics for rooms and utilities and special housing types. We're going to go over a quick inspection checklist that has um, sort of ideas for items to bring with you on inspections, provide a couple of tips, and then we're going to have a little quiz at the end. So before we move forward, I just wanted to note that this is a very broad training um, to provide you with basic knowledge that you're going to need to carry out effective and thorough inspections. Um, sometimes these issues, though, can get very technical. So I might not be able to answer all of your questions today, but the questions that I can't answer will definitely you know, take back with us and, and look into. Um, and I also wanted to note that we will be covering assessing for lead-based paint hazards a little bit, but we're not gonna be going into that in a ton of detail. Um, if you are looking for additional information about lead-based paint issues, Homebase um, does have additional training materials on that topic that we'd be more than happy to share with you. So let us know if you need those. Okay, so 
Why are HQS inspections important? First of all, they promote access to safe, suitable housing for people regardless of their income, right? We wanna make sure that people are able to have, um, you know, housing that meets their needs, that is adequate, that is safe, and that um, people, uh, you know, who are using programs such as the COC funded programs have access to that, to that level of housing, just like everybody else. Um, we, uh, having to pass inspections incentivizes landlords to provide better housing to everyone, right? Making sure that landlords um, maintain a base level um, of, of quality in their housing is, is good for everyone. Um, inadequate housing is a public health issue. Substandard housing, as you probably know, can lead to issues such as increased asthma, lead paint poisoning, and other environmental health issues. Um, inspections make sure that all COC funded housing meets a standard minimum level of quality, um, regardless of location. So instead of each agency or person having to make subjective determinations that um, might be inconsistent within a given community, everyone is sort of on the same page about what those standards are. And another important underlying policy um, to be aware of is that HUD really wants people to be able to choose where they live. Um, you know, it's not mandated by HUD that you live in a particular place or a particular type of housing. So this means that there has to be some sort of way to inspect private apartments to make sure that they are habitable. Um, so, you know, this is a way to make sure that, that you know, the clients that you serve are able to choose the places they live um, and also make sure that, that these um, houses, that this housing meets minimum um, requirements. One last thing I just wanted to say is these standards are a floor, not a ceiling. So again, they are intended to create a baseline, right? These are the minimum standards. Um, that's not, you know, the, the best that the housing can be. So just remember that. Um, does anyone have anything else they want to add about why HQS inspections are important, either in the chat or um, either or coming off of mute and saying something about that? All right. Um, okay, next slide, please. So now we're going to focus on where HQS requirements come from. Um, they come from the COC program interim rule, which requires HQS inspections and describes what needs to be inspected and the frequency of inspections. So what needs to be inspected? All leasing or rental assistance units paid for through the COC program. When do units have to be inspected? Before move in and then annually thereafter. And then owners must correct any deficiencies within 30 days after inspections. If um, deficiencies aren't corrected, subsidies cannot be paid for those units. So again, COC funding cannot be used to pay for units that haven't been inspected or where the unit has failed HQS inspection, um, unless the owner corrects those deficiencies within 30 days of the uh, inspection. And the program ver verifies that the deficiencies have indeed be been corrected. Um, I just want to note that during um, the height of the pandemic, so to speak, there were a number of waivers that HUD issued. Um, there were waiver, waivers available on the requirement of um, inspections. That waiver has expired. It expired on um, September 30th. So this requirement is back into full effect. Um, Okay, someone mentioned in the chat that another reason why HQS inspections um, are important is that they let clients know what standards they should also expect from landlords. Yes, exactly. Um, it's an important moment for um, you to be able to educate and empower your clients so that they know, right, this is, this is what my landlord is supposed to do. Um, someone also asked the question, who will schedule the reinspection before the 30 days. Um, so who will schedule the reinspection? So that um, I think is probably something on at your programs level that your program might have a policy around. Um, I think probably the person who inspected the unit and noted that it failed would probably do the reinspection. Um, 
So I'm going to come back to the question um, from, from Mike Eckhart. Um, Nicole, I don't know if you could note that for a second, and then I will come back to it. Um, thanks. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, okay, so another thing that I wanted to note um, is that um, HQS, um, that the COC program interim rule also says that programs have to maintain HQS inspections records for five years to demonstrate compliance, right? So you not only have to do the inspections themselves, but you have to um, you know, make sure that you have the records to show that you did them. Um, and another note is that we would advise or recommend that you maintain lead paint inspection records indefinitely to show your due diligence in case those issues arise, because it, sometimes those issues arrive several years, longer than five years after an inspection occurs, right? And you want to be able to say, I have the record that I, you know, looked for lead paint based issues. This is what I did, et cetera. So again, record keeping is super vital. Um, if you can't show HUD that you conducted these inspections, then they didn't happen, right? That's sort of HUD's, uh, HUD's point of view. Um, so a little bit of background on the next slide on um, some more legal framework. So the COC program uh, interim rule incorporates HQS regulations um, that apply to HUD's housing choice voucher program. So basically the COC program interim rule you know, has some of its own HQS regulations, but overall it just adopts the regulations that HUD already had for the housing choice voucher program. Um, and a note about the housing choice voucher program is that these regulations are intentionally vague, right? So they don't tell you exactly how to make decisions about housing and these inspections. And that's because HUD's housing choice voucher program is a national program. And that covers lots of different climates, lots of different types of housing. Um, so, you know, for example, what might be makes sense to be required in, you know, um, I don't know, Northern Wisconsin isn't gonna be required in Louisiana. So they're intentionally vague. Um, therefore, you're gonna also need to look to local laws and housing codes to fill in the blanks. So if it seems like the HQS requirement doesn't tell you enough information, for example, about how hot, how hot hot water has to be, then you're gonna need to look to local laws. You can also look to local housing authority administra administrative plans, um, although it's not clear that those would apply to COC funded programs. So I would use those as a guidance, as guidance and not a mandate. So hopefully um, that all makes sense as well. Okay, and the next slide, um, just wanted to reiterate again that in addition to these uh, regulations, you should be familiar with safety related local laws, um, such as those about lead paint safety, fire codes, or you know, um, what are the rule, local rules of, around egress, prohibitions on certain appliances, um, carbon monoxide detectors, water and air temperature standards. And where there is a discrepancy between local laws and HQS regulations or HQS um, standards that have to do with safety, you're going to go with whichever is the stricter requirement, right? So HQS, for example, the regulations don't require carbon monoxide detectors, right? That doesn't mean that the apartments don't need them. It means that if the local laws say that they that you need them, you need to have them because that's the stricter requirement. Um, okay, I'm gonna take a moment to pause. It looks like there are lots of questions coming in. Okay, so what can someone do if a program pays for housing but does not inspect house and the house is uninhabitable? Well, I would say that if this is a COC funded program, they cannot pay for housing that is uninhabitable. That's, that's unacceptable. Um, inspections need to happen before move-in and annually thereafter. And if the unit fails, the landlord has to make those repairs within 30 days or COC funding cannot be used. Um, 
yes, the date for the COVID ex uh, exemptions requiring the, the COVID waivers, they did expire on September 30th. Where does the housing specialist find the local laws and regulations? So that's a good question. I think some of these are available online. Um, there might be, you might be able to call, um, I'm trying to think where, where would be the best place to find them. So I would do a, a search online. Um, another thing is you can always reach out to us at home base and we can try to help you find the local laws or regulations um, that apply to your particular area. But usually those should be available online. Um, links after the training. So I, I'm not sure if you mean links to local laws or what, what links. Um, Santa Clara County covers a lot of different jurisdictions, so we haven't, we don't have links to all of the different local laws. What we are providing um, is the, we providing the slides and the recording of the training. Um, so, but again, feel free to reach out to us if you're having trouble finding um, particular law or particular guidance um, online about something, perhaps we can help you find a place for that. Okay, how long does a landlord have to replace a water heater that is not working? 30 days. A unit will fail if there's not a water heater that is working. People must have access to hot water. It has to be fixed within 30 days. Okay, all right. Or if there's a local law where this housing is located that says it has to be sooner, then that's the law that would apply. So that's another thing, just make sure that you are aware of if there are local laws that say, for example, landlord you know, has to provide a certain amount of heat and hot water, you know, and if they don't, then X, Y, and Z will happen you know, in a certain number of days. Um, hopefully that answers questions that everyone has so far. All right, so next slide. So, okay, here's a question that I have for you. The HQS inspection checklist doesn't provide information about where the smoke detector needs to be located. What would you do? What would you do if you were working with an HQS inspection checklist um, that didn't tell you anything about where a smoke detector um, needed to be located? And you wanted to check that out. Where do we go to fill in the blanks? So you can look to your local fire code. Most fire codes have details about where in the room smoke detectors should be located. They're usually supposed to be um, in the corner corners of rooms because that's, um, or sorry, not supposed to be in the corner of rooms because that's usually where smoke goes last. Um, yes, so Rudy answered check local codes, exactly. Um, local housing authority administrative plans might also have those details as well. If you really can't find anything, you can also contact the local fire department for guidance as well. Okay, definitions. So we're going to talk now about some definitions used in inspections. Um, just note that this language is based on the HUD Housing Choice Voucher Program form HUD 52580, which you can find easily online. And it's probably, um, you know, um, which you can find e easily online. Um, sorry, Melanie just noted in the chat that the California Apartment Association also has great info. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. So these terms apply into individual aspects of your um, inspection. For example, the kitchen sink can pass or fail, the door can pass or fail, you know, the wall can pass or fail, but it also um, is the, it, the, these are the words that you use to describe the entire decision that you're going to be making about a unit. Um, so for example, the stove could pass, but the entire unit might fail for other reasons. So a pass is where um, a unit or an item passes inspection, right? Everything is good. Pass with a comment is where the item or the unit passes inspection, but a note is added about an issue that needs to be addressed, right? So scratched floors, 
um, will be a pass, right? Most likely, unless they po uh, pose some sort of safety issue, but the landlord should really address that, right? So you're gonna say pass, but please, you know, buff the floors, take out the scratch floors, et cetera. Um, inconclusive means you need more information, right? So you're not failing the unit, but you're saying I wasn't able to come to a conclusion. So for example, if uh, a piece of equipment is on its way, right? Like you said, you're inspecting the unit, but the refrigerator is, you know, being delivered tomorrow or something along those lines. So it's inconclusive. Um, you know, you, you mark it inconclusive, inconclusive and you come back and finish your inspection when you have access to that item. So fail, obviously that means there's a problem. Um, if anything in the unit fails, the whole unit fails. So that means that, you know, if um, there's an electrical socket that doesn't work and it, and it fails, the whole unit fails. And when the unit fails, someone cannot move in, right? And you cannot use COC funding to pay for that unit. Um, there are no conditional passes. You can't say, you know, pass so long as the landlord fixes the electricity in the bedroom. It has to be, everything has to be in the shape that it needs to be when you do your inspection. Um, I'm also seeing a comment in the chat that cosmetic issues do not mean that it, the unit would fail. Yeah, so it so really what we're talking about, and again, this is going to get to the next, the next slide is really gonna talk about this a little bit more, but there's a lot of discretion with these inspections. Um, essentially, what you're really looking for with fails are things that don't work or things that pose such a safety hazard that someone cannot live there. Um, you know, some people might deem peeling paint a cosmetic issue, but if it's lead based paint, that's a safety issue. So it's hard to answer that question, um, you know, totally, but I think in general, yes, cosmetic issues, things that are more surface level that don't pose any kind of safety. Certainly ugly wallpaper isn't gonna be a reason to fail. It might be a reason your client doesn't wanna live there, but um, that's not gonna be a, a failure issue. Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, great, yes. Thank you, Nathaniel, for, um, from the housing department for offering to direct people to, to, to the um, information that they need with regard to those local codes. That's great. Okay, so, and lastly, I just wanted to talk about left and right. Obviously, my left right now might not be your left, you know, so on and so forth. Um, you're going to need a standardized way to communicate this within the agency on your forms so that when you're talking about where there are issues in the units, um, the notation is clear, like where, where you're talking about. Um, so a common way to do that is um, to treat left and right as oriented as though you're looking at the front of the unit from the outside, right? So um, if this is the door that I'm coming in, or this is this is the front of the unit, the front of the unit or the, the building, this is you know my left, my right, so on and so forth. Hopefully that's clear. But when you're writing down um, in the inspections where the issues are, you're saying, you know, left wall in bedroom, you know, has um, a, a six foot um, like area of peeling paint, you're gonna wanna be able to, to make it clear that where that left is. Okay, all right, moving on to the next slide. So as I've been talking about, housing uh, quality standards are very, very general. And this is to allow for differences across the country and different unit types and to maximize um, client choice. So often it's going to be up to your judgment and your discretion to fill in the blanks, along with some of these other things like local, uh, local housing codes and laws. Um, an example is that HUD uh, in their HQS regulations says you have to have a safe lockable door. What is safe? Uh, what, what, is, what is lockable? It's not defined. You have to use your judgment. Is a thin door with a flimsy lock that I could you know, pick with a pen good enough? Um, is a door that's only unlockable for one side good enough? I don't think so. Um, so again, you're going to really just have to use your common sense. And again, if you're unsure, 
consult those local laws or an expert in the particular area, like an electrician, um, a plumber, et cetera. Also, tenant preference is determinate, determinative if there is no baseline health or safety issue, right? So it's all about what the tenant wants. Where do they wanna live? So talk to them about what are the things that they're okay to deal with, perhaps some of those cosmetic issues. Again, um, their preference doesn't matter if it's a safety issue, that, that's a fail. But if it's just sort of a thing about like the room size, um, or general wear and tear that doesn't impact safety, it's really gonna come down to what your client wants. Um, so that is, uh, and the last thing is that HUD sometimes is able to, able to provide waivers for situations where a unit would fail for a reason that is related to tenant preference. So for example, sometimes, um, you know, HUD may have ideas about certain areas, certain neighborhoods, certain, um, like if it's next to a train track, or I don't know, I'm trying to think of different um, situations where HUD might say this is not a great situation, might fail the unit, but the client really wants to live there, you might be able to seek a waiver by going to the local field office and asking for that waiver. Okay, and the next slide, please. All right, so here's another question I have for you. Assuming there are no interior issues with this house, what, what do we think? What do we think? Would you pass this house? It's pretty amazing, right? I would live there. There's nothing wrong with living in a shoe. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just a shoe shape. Yeah, yeah totally. I want to go there. I, I saw this picture and I was like, this, I, I'm living there. I'm, ba I'm basically an old woman who could live in a shoe. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, it could be over capacity with all the kids. That's true. Um, so this is just an example where tenant preference, if someone's like, I found this amazing house, if it meets all the other specifications, you know, you're good to go. They want to live in a shoe. It's great. Okay, so next slide, please. Before we get into some of the real nitty gritty specifics about what you're looking for during inspections, I just wanted to give some pointers on what makes an effective inspector. So first of all, you're gonna need technical, technical knowledge about what is required. Obviously you're here today to receive some of that. Um, effective inspectors need to be able to communicate about issues with the landlord and the tenant. So one way to ensure um, effective communication is possibly reviewing the checklist that you're using with the landlord and tenant. Um, and also you need to be able to explain why a decision was made, right? Why did the kitchen sink fail? Explain it, be able to explain it to your client and the landlord so that all of that is very clear. Um, because you're often left to your own discretion, you also need to have sound judgment. Also, you wanna be objective, right? It's not about would you personally want to live here or what you personally find acceptable. It's about um, what is, is objectively safe and what is objectively acceptable and what's acceptable to your client. Um, the effective inspector is thorough, obviously making sure that you are looking at every single thing on your checklist. And also you document issues and bases for your decision. So this will limit your liability and also make sure that you're able to effectively communicate again about your decisions with landlords later on, right? Um, so you can make sure everyone's on the same page, write down all the details about why something failed or, you know, um, why you have concerns. So is there anything else that anyone wants to add about um, what, what you think makes an effective inspector either in the chat or come off mute? All right. So we're going to move to the next slide. Um, so this is one of these things, yeah, being thorough, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so how would you describe an initial HQS inspection to a new landlord? Um, it would be amazing if anyone wanted to come off mute and talk us through what they do, what you do when you're talking to a new landlord about an HQS inspection.
All right, I guess you're just going to be hearing from me today. Um, so one thing that you're you know, going to want to tell them is this is a requirement for this unit to receive COC, fund it, COC funding. Um, we inspect the unit to make sure that it meets, meets basic standards. We're going to need to look inside the unit. We're going to need to see the hallways, look at the heating and cooling equipment, um, make sure, please make sure that all the electricity and gas is on so that we can test it. Would you like to see the checklist? We'll let you know what we find. You'll have 30 days to correct any failing issues. Um, you know, and also if it's the first inspection, making sure they know that they're also going to have to pass annual inspections thereafter. And also just, you know, make sure to thank them for their cooperation um, and for, you know, making the unit available to you for inspection. So I think, you know, those are some things that you could do um, when you're having that kind of first initial inspection with the landlord. Okay. All right, so before getting into specifics, I just wanted to talk about some general unit requirements. Um, so just one note also that for now, at this part of the training, we are focusing on private individual units. Later on, I'm going to be describing the different requirements for other types of housing, such as SROs or shared housing. So again, we're just talking about private individual units right now. So for those units, every unit must have a living room, a bathroom, and a kitchen. The living room can be used as a sleeping area, but by no more than two people. And a studio apartment counts as having the living room. Um, the COC program interim rule also has regulations about the um, amount, the number of people who can be in each sleeping room. So units must have at least one bedroom or living slash sleeping room for each two people. Um, HUD sometimes grants waivers in high density areas. And also this was one of the waivers that HUD had during COVID-19. Um, again, that waiver expired on September 30th. Um, but again, that's you know one, basically two people per, per sleeping room. You also cannot have a situation where older children of the opposite sex would be required to share a room. Um, again, it doesn't matter where people actually sleep. HUD doesn't, you know, Matt doesn't care about that. It's just, are you putting this family in a unit where, um, you know, two older children of the opposite sex would have to share a sleeping room? And again, room size is a matter of tenant preference. HUD isn't generally concerned with square footage in these situations. It's more about, you know. Obviously, if it's really small, that would be a problem, but they don't, um, they're not too specific about that. Um, going back to the last slide, I'm seeing in the chat also yeah. someone sharing that before starting the inspection, you're going to want to make sure the landlord understands it should be move in ready to save time and trips to the unit. Awesome. Yes. Very good point. Right. Okay. Digging in a little bit deeper to what rooms used for living require. So HUD divides rooms up by rooms used for living and rooms not used for living. Rooms used for living are those that are regularly used and accessible. So examples are um, bedrooms, living rooms, kitchens, bathrooms, dens, hallways, staircases, the places you're in every day regularly for long periods of time. Rooms not used for living might be, for example, a garage or an attic space or potentially like an unfinished basement. Um, so rooms used for living have to have adequate electricity, security, windows, depending on the room. Not all rooms require windows and we'll get into that in a minute. Ceilings, walls and floors and be free of lead based paint hazards. Um, so, and in the next slides, we're going to go through what it means for each of these elements to be adequate. Okay. So we're going to focus now on what illumination and electricity is needed in each room. So each room has to have adequate natural or artificial illumination to permit normal indoor activities and to support the health and safety of occupants. Um, that's taken directly from, from the regulations. Um, electricity must be in working order. For living rooms specifically, 
living rooms have to have two separate outlets or one outlet and one permanently installed ceiling or wall fixture. fixture. Um, permanent uh, fixtures have to be hardwired. So, um, uh, for example, um, you could have a ceiling lamp and, and one um, outlet, or you could have two outlets. Um, kitchens specifically have to have one outlet and one permanently installed ceiling or wall fixture. fixture. Um, so that's, uh, that's the situation with regard to illumination and electricity in those rooms. Okay, slide. Um, so for bathrooms, bathrooms have to um, have a permanent ceiling or wall mounted light fixture in proper operating condition. No outlets are required in bathrooms. You just have to have a permanent ceiling or wall mounted light fixture. Rooms used for sleeping, again, need two outlets or one outlet and one permanently installed ceiling or wall fixture. Okay. Now we're going to talk about some hazards that you're gonna to wanna to look for. Um, so these are electrical hazards and we're mostly concerned about hazards that can lead to fires. So exposed uninsulated frayed wires, improper connections, improper outlet grounding, overloading of capacity, um, wires lying in or around standing water, um, that kind of stuff that would be very obvious generally. Um, a couple of tips for you when you're looking at electricity. Um, some outlets can be tied to the light switch. So before you assume that an outlet's not working, you might want to turn the light switch on. Um, something that I've, you know, that happens, unfortunately, fairly often is that when electricity is tested, um, sometimes it's the light bulb that's burnt out and not the electricity that's not working. So a lot of inspectors bring light bulbs with them just to double check like, okay, it's not the light bulb, um, it's th that the electricity itself is not working. And if you're unsure if something isn't safe, right, because you're not electricians, most of you probably, um, you can always mark something inconclusive and check with an expert. Um, so that is illumination and electricity. Um, okay, so now we're going to ask a question of you. In the first room that you inspect, you flip the light switch and nothing comes on. You plug in a working up appliance and it doesn't turn on. What do you do? What would you do? I'd say the first thing you do is ask the landlord what, uh, what's going on there. Yeah, exactly. Right, you ask, is the electricity off, right? Some, they might have the electricity off. Um, try and reset it, check the breaker, use a plug-in tester, talk to the landlord. Yes, all really, really excellent ideas. Yes. Um, so you, yeah, if the landlord says the electricity is on, check that the light bulbs aren't burnt out, um, check that the outlet's not manufacturing by checking electricity in other parts of the unit. Um, so, uh, you know, just you all are, are on top of it. Okay, so the next slide, please. Yeah, so now we're going to be talking, for, well, first of all, does anyone have any questions so far about illumination and electricity requirements? All right. Okay, so windows, window safety and adequacy. Um, basements and first floor windows are windows that can be reached from the ground. So for example, windows that are accessible via fire escape um, that are designed to be opened have to have a lock. And windows with a sill less than six feet from the ground are considered accessible as well. Um, windows also have to be able to keep the elements out, right? So you're gonna be looking on, looking at cracks, holes, weather stripping, gaps and panes, things like that. Um, examples of fails here would be broken or missing panes, obviously, or um, you know, unlockable accessible windows or accessible windows that don't have locks. Um, so a pass would be possibly minor cracks in the pane that don't cause a cutting hazard, splintered sills that aren't you know, terribly splintered, um, things of that nature. Also, HUD does not require screens in windows. So that's just something to note. 
Okay, and the next slide. Um, so looking more specifically now at window requirements in different rooms, bathrooms need to have one openable window or other adequate ventilation, such as a fan. Living rooms need to have at least one window. Um, it does not need to be openable unless it's necessary to provide a means of escaping during a fire or if it's necessary for ventilation or it will be used as a sleeping room. Um, sleeping rooms need at least one window and it must be openable if the window is designed to do so. Kitchens do not need windows. Um, other rooms not mentioned here also do not need windows. Hallways don't need windows, entryways don't need windows. Um, the next slide is going to talk about um, inspecting ceilings, floors, and walls. So here you're just checking for basic soundness and condition. Um, this is where lead-based paint hazards will come into play. Also with looking at windows as well, I forgot to mention that. Um, a lot of times lead-based paint hazards can come up around windows and door jams because that's where a lot of friction occurs and where paint can peel, right? So that's a place where you're gonna wanna pay attention to peeling paint as well. You're gonna wanna pay attention to peeling paint everywhere, but those are specific places where you're likely to find more peeling paint. Um, so an example of a fail with a ceiling or wall or floor um, would be something that's so structurally unsound that it could collapse, severe bulging or buckling, large holes, um, things that would be obvious, okay? Passes would be small cracks, um, possibly some, you know, slight water stains depending, um, you know, on whether it seems like that might be um, an issue that could cause mold. Heavily worn floor surfaces, again, that's more of a cosmetic issue. Um, scratches and linoleum, that kind of stuff that would most likely be a pass. Okay, so now moving on to lead-based paint. And again, I'm just providing a brief overview of that for you today. Um, if you would like more in-depth information about lead-based paint issues, please let us know and we can connect you to some of our other materials that are more in-depth. Um, this is a very important part of your job as an HQS inspector. Uh, lead-based paint, lead paint poisoning is a serious public health issue. Um, lead paint used to be a common additive in paints because it made surfaces stronger and easier to clean. So a lot of lead-based paint was found in bathrooms or kitchens because um, they were often the places where that you'd get the most dirty and you need to scrub a lot more. Um, in 1978, the federal government banned the consumer use of paint that contained lead. So most homes constructed before 1978 have lead paint, often under other layers of paint. Most homes built before uh, 1940 have, uh, about 87% have lead-based paint. So again, it's, it has to do with how likely you are to find lead-based paint depends on the, the age of the building. So why is lead-based paint dangerous? Well, when lead paint is in good shape, when there aren't cracks or chips or when it's located behind a barrier, it's not a problem. However, deteriorated surfaces that have lead-based paint can lead children to be exposed to lead dust and lead chips. And when children six years and younger are exposed to lead-based paint, it can lead to all kinds of bad um, health outcomes, such as um, slow growth, hearing problems, anemia, um, it can cause uh, hyperactivity and other sort of behavioral or possible learning problems. Um, just something to note um, that there's various guidance about whether lead impacts children six and under or just children under six. In the interest of taking the most caution, we're using six and under criteria for this training. However, you should use whatever guidelines your agency uses. Um, I just noted there's a question in the chat. To clarify, a window without a screen would be a pass. Yes, um, windows do not have to have screens. That is true. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about lead-based paint and rental assistance properties. So the, the um, inspection process for those units is, if it's a pre-1978 unit, again, in 1978, lead-based paint was outlawed um, in commercial properties. If it's a pre-1978 unit with a family with children six and under, 
you're going to want to um, conduct a visual assessment of all surfaces, interior and exterior, for deteriorated paint surfaces. I'm talking about peeling, chipping, and flaking. Um, you're going to want to check inside the unit, common area, common areas, um, the the building exterior, all, basically all those painted areas. Um, if there's an issue found, the owner has to stabilize deteriorated surfaces before move-in, or if there is a tenant inside, they have to do it within 30 days of notification. Stabilization essentially means repairing the, the issues with the paint. Um, a unit then has to be cleared by a certified inspector if the affected areas were more than 20 square feet on an exterior surface or two square feet on an interior surface. If this is not done, then a unit fails. And in addition, again, um, and you're probably familiar with this already, before the execution of the lease, it's the owner or the owner's agent's responsibility to disclose if they know anything about the unit having lead-based paint or lead-based paint hazard, hazards, if the unit um, that the housing was built prior to 1978. So a lot of you have probably seen these notices when you've rented you know, your own apartments or you've seen them with your clients. Um, units, if you're going into housing that was built prior to 1978, um, then the landlord has to disclose to you the presence of lead-based paint or lead-based paint hazards. Um, okay, I'm seeing a question about what about mold? If there is no visible mold in a unit that previously had a mold issue, but the smell of mold persists in the unit, is that a fail or a pass? So that's really, I think, um, uh, that's a hard question. I think that's one of these judgment questions, right? If you smell mold, it's probably still there. Um, I don't know if other if, if anyone else wants to chime in. This would be a perfect time for those of you who've done these before to give your opinions. Um, but I would say if it smells like mold, that's a fail. Uh, that that would be my judgment call. Um, should not smell of mold. Does, does anyone else want to have anything to add to that? Anyone disagree? Hi, this is Daniel. Uh, in my personal experience, again, personal experience, not housing department experience. Yeah. When dealing with mold, if it smells like mold, there's mold. In order to eradicate mold from flooring, from wallboard, you have to eradicate more than what's there. Mold is microscopic. You have to eradicate more than what's there. I personally would not pass the unit. Excellent, because, thank you. Just because it is so hard to get rid of. Right, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Yes, not all mold is visible, right? That's one of the most insidious things about mold. Um, and as you said, the spores can be microscopic. Um, yeah, so I think the smell is a strong indicator that there, there probably is still a mold issue. Um, so, okay, and someone asked about asbestos. So asbestos is not specifically called out in the HQS inspections, but my understanding is that, I mean, what I would do is I would go to the local, the local codes because I think local codes um, probably have a lot to say about asbestos. Generally, my understanding about asbestos is that houses and buildings can have asbestos, many of them do. It just has to be, um, it has to be sort of uh, located in a, and I don't know if perhaps anyone with more information with, uh, or more experience with asbestos, asbestos can speak to this, but um, if it's in any way like crumbling or um, in other ways compromised, asbestos has to be, um, I think, you know, it, it, there are certain rules around asbestos. Having asbestos in the house in and of, of itself is not necessarily a problem, but certain, in certain ways, having asbestos that is compromised is a problem. Um, so again, I'm no asbestos expert. <laughs> there are many asbestos as experts out there, um, but I would recommend that you go to your local um, your local codes to find out a little bit more. Uh, there's uh, another mold question. If mold's not visible and there's no smell, but the tenant has complaints, would this be a fail? There was mold previously in the unit. Um, 
So I think, again, that's kind of a judgment issue. Um, you know, they might be able to smell things that you can't smell. Smell is also subjective in some ways. Um, I don't know, um, you know, I'd be curious to hear what other people have to say about that. How have you handled situations where there is an issue that your client has identified that perhaps you're not seeing? Does anyone have thoughts about that? Love to, love to know. So I actually just wanted to add to that question. Yeah. Um, so what happened in my unit is that the property manager mentioned that they don't have the expertise um, to really look into the mold, that if it's not visible, there's nothing they could do about it. Um, in that case, would the um, client be able to reach out to a specialist and maybe forward that bill to the property manager or are they responsible for it? So I think that's a good question. I don't know what the COC regulations would say off the top of my head, but I would say that it's the landlord's responsibility to make sure that the apartment is habitable. And so they should be the ones who are addressing this issue. Now in practice, we know that um, sometimes that doesn't always happen. And obviously you're gonna try to do whatever you can to keep your client housed. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really tough, I think that's a really tough call. Um, yeah, Natasha says, correct. The landlord would usually have to call a remediation company. So, okay. you know, that's, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, okay, so someone asked a question about uh, the lead-based paint. Is the two square feet and 20 square feet of affected areas one region or a cumulative from scattered areas? So it's individual. That's my understanding is that it's, it's individual. I don't know, um, Nicole, if you have other thoughts of that. Okay, okay, Nicole says it's two, two square feet per interior room. Okay, so it's cumulative within the room. All right, that's, that's good to know. Um, okay. All right, so. And we can send, uh, we'll just go ahead and send the lead-based paint resources with the housing, uh, with the HQS materials at the end. So you can, if you want more information on those de minimis thresholds, um, we have further resources for that. Yeah, we're very fortunate today in that Nicole Thomas is our local lead-based paint expert. So thank you, Nicole. She's, she's the one who did our lead-based paint training. Um, okay, great. So just moving forward really quickly to lead-based paint and leasing. So we were talking about lead-based paint and rental assistance. Now we're talking about lead-based paint and leasing. All of the requirements are the same, except that the program is responsible for stabilizing and fixing the paint defects and providing ongoing maintenance um, of any lead-based paint issues and providing those disclosures of lead-based paint or lead-based paint hazards in housing built prior to 1978 to all prospective residents. Um, and obviously the program you know, is responsible, but the program and the landlord um, must determine how to divide up the cost of, of these efforts right, um, in a leasing program. Okay, all right, so lastly, um, just a note that um, there are some variations on the lead-based paint uh, regulations regarding other project types other than leasing and rental assistance. I'm not going to go over those here, but again, Nicole is going to send out some of our more in-depth materials on that later on. Okay, so this is a question I have for you. You are inspecting a unit in a building built in 1950. It, if it passes inspection, the unit will house a family with a mother and two 10-year-old twins. The paint in the kitchen is cracking and peeling very badly. What do you do? Anyone? No. Okay. So the housing was built in 1950. So that's pre-1978. So you can presume 
you can assume that there that, that there's lead based paint there. Um, has popped in the chat that they would ask oh. the landlord to inspect the unit for lead. Okay, yeah. So it's interesting because it is technically a unit where um, that that's pre nineteen seventy eight. However, the children are ten years old, so they're not six or under. So actually, the requirement to inspect the unit for lead isn't triggered. Um, what you could do is pass with a comment and ask the landlord to make the repairs to the cracking and, and, and peeling paint. Um, so, you know, that's basically, there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a trick question there, but it's basically just a reminder that it's about the age of the building and the age of the children who are going to be living in the unit. Okay. All right, now we're gonna move into requirements for specific spaces, starting with kitchens. So all units have to have a kitchen, um, a unit or an area for preparing food. Um, it can be an extension of another room. Everyone is all about these like open concept, you know, spaces these days. So obviously it doesn't have to be a closed kitchen, a separate kitchen. Um, kitchens have to have a stove or a range with an oven. All burners have to work and have working knobs. Um, you can have a microwave oven instead of a range and oven if the tenant agrees. And that's the arrangement for all of the building's tenants, right? So your client cannot be singled out as the person who doesn't have a, a, an oven. Um, but there can be a microwave oven if the tenant agrees and that's how it is for all of the tenants. Hot plates are not an acceptable replacement for stoves and ovens. Refrigerators must be able to, um, you know, pro provide appropriate refrigeration for the family. They have to be the right size for the family. So you can't have like a mini refrigerator for a family of, you know, seven people. Um, they must be able to maintain a temperature low enough to prevent food spoilage as well. So that's generally above 32 degrees, but below 40 degrees. Um, kitchens also have to have a permanent sink fixture um, with a gas trap to prevent sewer gas from entering the unit. They have to have hot and cold water. And kitchens also have to have a space for food storage preparation and serving of food. Um, so a table or a portable storage unit for food will suffice. Um, and tenants can bring their own appliances, but they still have to pass inspection. So, um, you know, basically someone can say, I have this refrigerator, I wanna use it, that's great. You just have to make sure that it's functioning and all that good stuff. Um, okay, so the next slide is gonna be talking about bathrooms. Bathrooms have to be available for the exclusive use of the unit, right? So it can't be a shared bathroom for all of the units on a floor. And again, we're talking about private units here, not shared housing or SROs. Um, they have to be in a separate enclosed room, right? You can't just have like a toilet in the middle of the living room. The toilets have to flush. Sinks have to be fixed. You can't have a, a moving sink. Those have to have hot and cold water and there has to be a gas trap there as well. Okay, in the next slide, um, bathrooms also have to have a tub or a shower. Um, and they have to have hot and cold water. Um, the water temperature is one of those things that's determined by local law. So that's something that you're going to want to know. What is a gas trap? The gas trap is the, does anyone want to describe a gas trap? It's kind of, it's a little bit hard to describe um, except visually. What we'll do is we'll send out a picture of a gas trap. It's basically uh, the, the kind of the, the pipe that sort of is windy and bendy um, that also I won't get into it. We're going to set, we'll send out a picture of it. Um, but essentially it, it prevents gas from coming back up through the sewer system into, through sinks, through the sink pipes. Um, okay. So, um, all right. Let's see, where was I? Okay. So fails, ex yes. Okay. So fails um, include clogged toilets. Um, major water leaks, if there's a portable sink, um, if the, the only sink is the kitchen sink, that would be a fail. Bathrooms have to have a sink as well. Also, it'll fail if there are electrical wires close to water sources. 
Passes would be slow draining water, right? If it drains, but it's just a little bit slow, possibly like chipped porcelain could be a pass. Minor leaks, a dripping faucet, if it's not you know, dripping too badly. Um, no shower curtain rod would be a pass. That's something you can just buy. Um, those are examples of passes. Okay, so the next slide, um, I just wanna reiterate that um, these, uh, these requirements we've been talking about apply to rooms used for living, uh, right? So they apply to bedrooms, dining rooms, all of the places um, that, uh, you know, people are spending a fair amount of time and, um, you know, regularly. Um, so they don't apply to utility rooms, sheds, um, you know, those garages, places, places like that. Okay. All right. So you're inspecting a unit's interior hallway. What are you checking for when you're inspecting the interior hallway? Can anyone tell me what you would be looking for? I think there was also a question on a GFCI outlet near water. So I think it depends on what's meant by near water. If you just have an outlet near next to the sink, that's fine. Um, that's pretty standard. Um, I mean, if it's right next to the tub, I would say that that's probably problematic again. That's really um, an issue for discretion. I don't know if anyone else has thoughts on that. Um, feel free to pipe, chime in. Um, so you're gonna wanna look when you're looking at um, ceilings and, and sorry, uh, live, other rooms, rooms used for living and halls, you will wanna look at floor condition, ceiling condition, wall condition, if there's adequate natural or artificial illumination and just any hazards. For example, those lead-based paint hazards, um, if it's pre-1978 and, ch and children six or younger are gonna be living there. Um, okay, so moving on to the building exterior. Um, here, you're really just looking for major structural issues and obvious problems. You're not expected to be an architect or an expert in construction. No one's expecting you to you know, get on the roof or anything like that. You're just looking for things that are going to impact the unit. So condition of the foundation of walls. Are there large holes? Is there leaning, buckling, um, you know, defects that might result in vermin infestation, things like that. Um, conditions of stairs, rails, and porches. Are there missing stairs? Are there rotting elements? Um, one thing that HUD uh, requires is that handrails have to be present on extended sections of stairs. So generally four or more consecutive steps. Also with building interior, uh, exterior, excuse me, <clears throat> um, you're going to wanna make sure that the roof is structurally sound and waterproof. Again, um, you're not gonna be getting up on the roof, but you can usually tell if there are issues with the roof, um, you know, you'll see leaking issues um, and, you know, other evidence that the unit wouldn't pass. Um, also, if there are gutters present, you're gonna wanna see what uh, sort of what um, condition they're in. Um, you're also gonna wanna look for those lead-based paint hazards on the exterior as well as we've been talking about. Um, and just a note about tie downs for manufactured homes. Um, those have to have, uh, all manufactured homes have to have proper tie down devices capable of surviving wind loads common to the area. Um, okay, so moving on to heating and cooling. Um, okay, so, um, so an important part of inspections is making sure that systems in the unit are safe and functional. So with heating and cooling systems, you're gonna be focusing on temperature control and any fire and explosion hazards. Um, so you're going to ask, does the system heat and cool adequately? Again, this is where you're going to want to know your local codes um, determining heating and cooling standards. And you can check um, heating and cooling using some of the tools we're going to talk about in the checklist at the end. Um, you're going to want to make sure that there is a water heater. 
And you're also gonna wanna make sure that there aren't any water heater hazards. Um, so for example, gas or oil water heaters should be located in um, living areas without safety, uh, sorry, that they should not be located in living areas without safety dividers or shields. Um, water heaters must also have temperature pressure release valves and discharge lines in case of steam buildup during malfunction. Um, okay sources of heat include electric baseboards, radiators, or forced air systems. Um, heaters don't, the source of heat doesn't have to be in each room. So, you know, there doesn't have to be a, a radiator in each room, for example, so long as the heat can pass between the rooms. Um, things that are not okay would be unvented room heaters that burn gas, oil, or kerosene. Um, also, portable electric heaters uh, are not acceptable. All right. Um, one tip is that if the, if the unit is located in a large building, you can check to see the inspection record and see if it recently passed, and that's okay. All right. So for plumbing... Um, when you're looking at plumbing, you're going to want to focus on water quality and the water supply, right? So you're going to want to make sure that there's enough water coming out. It's not just, you know, dripping. Um, also want to, you know, make sure that the water quality is good. You want to check for evidence of heavy corrosion. Is the water brown? Does it have an odor? Um, plumbing must be in good working odor, order. Um, there has to be a sewer connection. Units have to be connected to a city or town sewer system all of that stuff. All right, moving on um, from the specific aspects of a unit to, the, um, to sort of more general health and safety questions. Um, and re again, remember your area might have more strict requirements than the ones I'm going to be talking about, so you aren't gonna wanna know those. So one is that exterior doors and those leading to common hallways must be lockable. Um, examples of fails would be if there's just a chain lock, that's not, um, that's not going to work for HUD. Uh, and also a breath best practice is no double keyed deadbolt locks because of potential fire issues, right? So you don't want to have a door where you have to have a key on both sides to get it out, right? If you can't leave without a key, that's problematic. Um, use and maintenance of the unit, uh, must be possible without unauthorized use of of other private properties. So what that means is people have to be able to get in and out of the unit without going through other people's apartments or properties. Um, with regard to fire exits, um, the building must have an alternative exit, such as fire stairs or windows, including the use of a ladder for windows above the second floor. Okay, next slide. So with regard to smoke detectors, on each level of the dwelling unit, including basements, but excluding spaces um, and un unfinished, sorry, excluding unfinished attics, at least one battery operated or hardwired smoke detector has to be in proper operating condition. Um, they have to be installed according to National Fire Protection Associated Association standards. And also, again, you're gonna wanna check the local fire code to make sure that um, those, uh, those smoke detectors are um, installed in accordance with that code as well. And again, um, the HQS uh, regulations do not require carbon monoxide detectors, but local laws often do. So you'll also just wanna make sure that, um, that you know if your jurisdiction requires those as well. If a building has elevators, they have to work. And interior stairs and common halls have to also be safe to use, right? You're wanna, gonna wanna check for any loose, broken, or missing steps, places that need guardrails that don't have them, et cetera. Um, someone asked, are coded locks okay to use? Uh, there's nothing in the HQS regulations about that either way. Um, what I would say is that if you have to have a code to get out, that would be a problem because um, that could pose a fire issue. Um, okay. All right, so a couple of other things to look for. 
you're going to want to look for evidence of infestation, right? Mice, roaches. And this is, again, sort of an issue that's up to your discretion and also the discretion of your client. It's kind of about, uh, about severity, right? Um, every now and then, you know, you might see a roach, um, for example, you know, in a kitchen or something like that. That doesn't necessarily mean there's an infestation. An infestation is really, um, you know, more, more than one. Um, or if you see, you know, evidence of mouse droppings and things like that, that's going to be, that's going to be an issue. Um, also, HUD doesn't expressly address bed bugs issues in HQS, but that is, you know, obviously a, a, an issue where I think that would be a fail. Because um, it poses a, a health and safety issue. You're going to want to look for garbage and debris. Um, so large piles of garbage and debris inside and outside of the unit will be a fail. Um, units need to have a way to um, dispose of refuse. Um, they must have adequate covered facilities. Um, so a dumpster, you know, a covered garbage can outside, something along those lines. And you're also going to want to assess the interior air quality. That's something we've been talking about a little bit about the smell of mold. You're going to want to determine, you know, does it seem like the air is free from, you know, the smell of gas? Um, if it's, you know, extremely dusty or if it smells like other pollutants, that's going to be an issue. Um, so HUD has this interesting also requirement that neighborhoods have to be reasonably free from disturbing noises and reverberations or other dangers to health, safety, and general welfare of the occupants. This is very, very general, and it's, you know, there isn't a lot of guidance on this, but I would say, you know, um, if a unit is, um, is you know, right next to a railroad track, that could be a problem that could cause, you know, major reverberations. Um, if it's next to, you know, the town dump and, you know, or a, a toxic waste <laughs> plant, you know, just these are all kinds of things where you're really just kind of using your common sense. Um, you know, if, if you're in a in, in, in mudslide area where there was, you know, just a mudslide last week, I'm kind of, you know, being a little bit, uh, you know, obvious right now, but it's just kind of to point out that, um, if the house can be located in or the house itself or the unit itself could be pristine and perfect on the inside, but you're also going to want to um, make sure that the neighborhood and the sort of general environment itself is safe as well. Okay. There's so, a question on how many smoke detectors are required in a one bedroom unit. They often see smoke detectors placed in hallways right next to the bedrooms, is that sufficient or does each bedroom still need a smoke detector? So what the HQ, so I would go to your local regulations because they're gonna be the best, the best place to provide you with this guidance. Um, so yeah, I would really just focus on what are the local guidance, but what HUD says is that each level of the dwelling unit, okay, um, including basements, but ex excluding unfinished attics, there has to be at least one smoke detector. Okay, so on each level. Um, so depending on how the one bedroom is set up, you know, you would make that call. But where you are might require uh, smoke detectors in every room. So again, this is, um, you know, sort of up to uh, up to your local code. So ho hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay, so yeah. Okay, yeah, so one, one piped in. Okay. All right. So again, um, just wanted to let you know and reiterate that we've been talking about private units, but housing quality standards also apply to what HUD defines as special housing types some of which are described here. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about shared housing and SROs. Shared housing, um, are those are buildings occupied by two or more families with a private space for the family and shared common areas. And SROs are pri uh, have private living and sleeping spaces, shared bathrooms and kitchens, and can only be occupied by one person. The private space can only be occupied by one person. 
Okay, so the next slide provides some detail about SROs. Um, we are running a little bit low on time, so I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but it's here. Um, and uh, if you have, um, you know, particular questions about housing quality standard inspections for SROs, shared housing, congregate housing, group homes, feel free to reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to provide you with that information. Um, but again, we're going to be providing these slides to you and you can um, have an opportunity to look at them at your leisure. But the most important thing to know is that there are HQS uh, uh, there are HQS um, inspections requirements for SROs and other types of um, special housing types that if you are um, housing people in those types of units, you're going to have to be aware of those. So let's go to the inspections checklist slide, which is a couple slides away. All right, so you'll notice that we also have a slide on shared housing um, that provides that information as well. And again, please feel free to reach out to us if you have questions about those types of special housing. We're more than happy to provide you with guidance on those. Okay, now here's your inspections checklist. These are not things that are necessary to bring, but they would probably be helpful to have. So cameras, so you can take picture and remember what things look like, measuring tape to determine you know, how, how large spaces are, how large, for example, um, a lead-based paint, potential lead hazard, lead-based paint hazard, um, peeling or cracking area is um, an extendable item to help you push buttons on smoke detectors, an electrical tester, gloves, a temperature measure for air and water, batteries, um, you know, in case, for example, you're checking to see does this fire detector work. Um, maybe it's just out of batteries, and wouldn't it be a shame to fail the unit just because it's out of batteries? Um, light bulbs to check those light uh, fixtures, extra detectors um, that might be useful as well. So you can provide one if necessary um, and flashlights. Okay, so we just have a couple tips for you. The first one is that you can use these annual inspections as a selling point to landlords. Um, you know, some landlords might not like the fact that you're going in there and doing inspections on an annual basis, but it's also an opportunity, you know, for you to help make sure that the apartment remains in good condition and to catch any issues before they escalate, um, which landlords, I think, usually like. Um, you can use some minor issues within the unit as sort of a bargaining chip sometimes to lower rent. Like for example, if you're doing an inspection before moving and the floors are scuffed up, you can say, hey, the floors are pretty scuffed up. We're not gonna you know, necessarily fail the unit, but could you lower the, the rent a little bit just to account for the fact that the floors aren't in great condition? Um, again, when in doubt, consult a, an expert in the particular area that you're concerned about, electricity, plumbing, whatever. Um, and for annual inspections, just make sure that you're really talking to your clients in advance of when you do these. So you can try to get a sense of what are the issues that they've been experiencing so you can have a heads up about them. And also just remembering that, you know, you're entering someone's home. And, um, you know, so although this is a requirement of the program and it has to be done, um, you just want to make sure that, you know, you are respectful and and sort of recognize that your clients might be feeling vulnerable about you coming in to inspect their personal space. And they may feel like their homemaking is being judged, for example. So they, to the extent that you can really educate your clients about why you're doing this um, and you know, just make them feel as comfortable as possible, um, that's helpful as well. Okay, all right, so. Now we're gonna have a quick quiz. I'm going to ask you if you think each one of these, in each one of these images, I'm showing you something that should pass, that should pass with a comment, that should fail, or that's inconclusive. So, all right. This shower head, what do we think of this shower head? Pass, fail, pass with comment, inconclusive. Feel free to put it in the chat. 
anyone, anyone. Don't be afraid, pass with comment, fail, pass with comment, inconclusive. So we have lots of different thoughts on this. Inconclusive from photo, pass with comment. Okay, so I think that um, what I would say based on my personal knowledge of this, because it was my shower head, <laughs> that I, I would pass, uh, I would pass with um, comment unless there was some kind of leaking or spraying issue because it doesn't seem to pose any kind of health or safety issue, but it is something that needs to be fixed. Um, again, if it were causing major leaking or spraying or some other issue with the access to the water or if there were mold around you know the the hole in the wall or there you know were some other issue with it um, but yes it's a little bit hard to tell from the image but that's that's sort of the idea um, okay the next one all right this exterior what are we thinking okay yeah someone's saying that's inviting mold into the wall yeah yeah so again, this is a matter of dis discretion, right? Not this picture, but the last one, right? Okay, fail. All right, so we're all on the same page. This is a fail. What is even happening here? The window opening is at ground level and it's completely open. Someone sort of made an attempt to half cover it. It's a major security issue. Um, what would make this a pass? If it were sealed off, if there were you know, a window with a secure lock, um, yeah, this is a, that's a no-go. Okay, next one. So this is some stained carpet. What do we think about this? Pass with a comment. <laughs> oh, that's a window, yeah. Pass with a comment, we're seeing. Anyone else? Pass with comment, fail. Yeah, so it's interesting that even within this training, people have different ideas about what would pass and what would fail. And that's kind of what we're talking about. It's very discretionary um, in a lot of ways, but um, you know, we're all using our, our best judgment. Okay, so I, I said this would be a pass with a comment because it's not a health issue or a safety hazard, but it should definitely be addressed. And your client may not find it acceptable. No one wants to move into a place that has a carpet in that condition. Um, you know, it, it, what could be a fail? It, it depends on what the stain is, right? It could be unsanitary, like, like Juan said. So I think, again, you want more information about it, but if it's just like someone, you know, dropped, uh, I don't know, clear nail polish on the ground or something like that, and, the, and then your client doesn't really care about it, it could be something where you try to say to the landlord, hey, can you lower the rent a little bit? Um, that kind of thing. Okay. So the next one, this is about room occupancy. So would this unit pass inspection for a family of five with one parent and four girls under the age of five? Remember that the COC program interim rule says that every sleeping area can only hold up to two people. Okay, so the answer to this one is no. So even if the living room were used as a sleeping room in this unit, it would not work because each sleeping room can only handle two people. But you could ask HUD for a waiver if this were a high density area. Okay, how about a family of three with one parent and two, teener, two teenagers, one boy and one girl? Yeah, that, that would pass. Um, that would pass, right? Because, um, you know, there's enough sleeping room for everyone and you're not forcing the teenagers to sleep in the same room one of them could sleep with one of the parents. Okay, how about a family with two adult parents and two male children ages five and six if the kitchen doesn't have a window? All right, that's a yes. There's enough space. And also kitchens don't need windows. So that was just a little, little extra. 
Okay, so we're getting a little bit low on time here. Let's just do a couple more. Um, okay, so these are kitchen drawers. What do we think? Will this pass? We're seeing some yeses, we're seeing some noes. Yeah, so if it's so broken as to make it a hazard when it's pulled out, or if it's just completely unusable, that's a fail. If it's just, you have to jiggle it a little bit, um, that's a pass with a comment. So again, it's gonna kind of, come down to what the situation really is. Okay, the next one I think will be the last one that we do. Okay, so in this unit, um, you are, so you are hopefully going to be putting a family in the top unit where those top windows are. And those windows do not have locks. What are we thinking? Pass, fail. Yeah, it's a fail because there's a fire escape there. It's accessible and they need to have locks on those windows. Um, okay, so this last page just provides some resources. Again, we're gonna send this out. You'll have access to these links. One of them is the HQS um, Housing Choice Voucher Inspection Form um, and just a couple of other HUD guides that might provide some more in-depth information for you. Um, just remember that a lot of HUD's guidance is specific to the Housing Choice Voucher Program, so it may not necessarily apply to COC-funded programs, but it's good guidance anyway. Um, so that's all we have. Um, anyone have additional questions? I know it was a super dense training, um, lots of technical stuff. We really sort of, you know, appreciate uh, your participation and the questions that you put in the chat and all that. Um, and uh, again, we have a, a feedback survey that we would love for you to fill out. We're always trying to make our, um, our trainings better. Um, so we'd love for you to fill that out. The link is in the chat. Um, Juan asked a question, are staff considered certified after this training? This is not, um, we don't provide certifications. It's not that kind of a training. Um, so HUD does also does not require for people to be certified to, to have some sort of official certification to do HQS inspections. Um, there are some places that provide certifications that they have developed. Um, but, uh, but this is not, um, we don't provide certification, so to speak. Yeah. 